Hello, everybody. I had an interesting discussion with Bronco Marchatich, who is a writer mostly on foreign policy for Jacobin Magazine and in these times, other places, and is a, uh, an astute observer in that area. So I wanted to get his assessment of the state of things among the Democratic candidates in the realm of foreign policy. And the conversation sort of diverged in a few places, but that's to be expected. I think, nonetheless, you will find it quite interesting. So here we go. All right, hello, Bronco. Hi, Michael. Um, even though you just gave me a primer on how do you pronounce your last name, I'm going to spare myself. Um, <laughs> Quite all right. <laughs> I'm. Uh, I, I want to be the uh, the share of the uh, you know the the left wing journalist scene. So you know, <laughs> uh, if I just get sort of known by my first name, that's fine. I respect that. And actually, it's a it's a good year, first name to go by with just the singular. You know, it has a little bit of a mystique to it. Whereas I couldn't get away with going by Michael. Yeah, yeah, two sort of too many guys called Michael uh, in the U.S. You know, I mean, I'm lucky because back in uh, in Serbia, if I was still there, uh, Branko is uh, not that uncommon a name. So you know, I, I get away with kind of being exotic when I'm in a English speaking country. Yeah, you know, being named Michael, it meant that growing up, I was surrounded by about a thousand other Michaels, and so that leads to a situation where you end up being called by your last name. And, oh, you know, so it's like it's like a schoolyard thing where it's, you know, you call you, you get called Tracy, which is like fine, I guess. But once you reach a well, yeah, when you're in, in school, that's uh, that can be a very wounding thing. Probably. <laughs> I don't know why we're talking about this, but. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> or, you know, I mean, because kids will always find something to, to uh, hit you with. I, I've I've had many uh, versions of, of all manner of kind of kind of slurs right to my name. So, you know. Yeah. All right. So let's move beyond that absolute nonsense and <laughs> begin the discussion uh, that I wanted to, to have with you, which is about foreign policy and the and the presidential candidates. I mean, you are uh, you have you've covered the foreign policy views of the candidates for different publications now for several years. Um, mm. First of all, I guess just by way of background, you know, I, I, when I, was, I was reading one of your in these times uh, articles and at the end you sort of like reference how bizarre I guess peers of yours found it that you studied U.S. politics in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> what what was the source of their <laughs> confusion or their uh, what was wh why would why did they react that way and how would you address that? Well, I think for a lot of people, they uh, a lot of people don't happen to have a chance to meet a New Zealander and then also for a New Zealander to, to be interested in U.S. politics and to be um, writing about it, uh, you know, whether professionally or not, I think it's kind of like a, like a novelty for people. It's very strange and, and in a lot of cases kind of inexplicable. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I would say that, for one, I think American Southerners don't realize that the entire world uh, follows U.S. politics very closely. Uh, not just uh, random New Zealanders, but you know, all over the place. Uh, you know, whether it's whether we're talking about Europe, Asia, wherever. Um, you know, so I don't know if that's a thing that people realize yet. But but it's uh, what happens in the U.S. is of intense uh, interest, uh, and people all over the world have very fierce debates um, about what's happening in the U.S. political system. In fact, I can tell you, I remember a time when I was taking the bus back from university um, in Auckland, New Zealand. And I and uh, I and a friend of mine, we overheard a guy at the back uh, having a very spirited debate with someone about why Mitt Romney was the better candidate instead of Obama. So you know, there's people. People, even though they're not based in the U.S., have very intense feelings about um, you know whether ca candidates or, or policies that are being uh, pursued in the U.S. And um, except I, except that the except that the New Zealand embassy in Washington or wherever it happens to be located, I don't think you'd hear a single discussion in the United States about who would be the better 
Prime Minister of New Zealand. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that New Zealand uh, and what goes on in New Zealand is, is probably not on the, uh, you know, the top of the priorities for uh, most Americans. And, you know, I mean, nor should it be really, uh, because uh, what New Zealand does does not really affect the US that much, except for the fact that we do have a very um, powerful agricultural sector. Um, and so that was actually that when the TPP was being uh, hammered out, there was a lot of um, uh, anxiety among U.S. policymakers because they were worried that, uh, well, you know, if we if we now open open up free trade with uh, with New Zealand, then you know the dairy sector may steamroll ours. So you know, on on a few issues, there's some worry, but uh, for the most part, I, I don't think uh, Americans should be too concerned about what happens in New Zealand. Um, well, it it, but, it, it it briefly burst on to at least pockets of political consciousness i remember in in 2013 when the snowden episode happened because new zealand is a member of five eyes you know the uh, intelligence sharing mm. alliance so you know but that's one of the very few instances in which it actually became a salient political issue and even then it wasn't particularly widespread <laughs> No, no. And, you know, there's a little more now um, because I think uh, our prime minister, our current prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, has sort of become the, excuse me, the, the, the new Trudeau uh, of, um, uh, of, I guess, international politics. You know, uh, Trudeau's star has kind of faded. Uh, even before this latest blackface scandal happened, uh, he kind of, people were increasingly kind of becoming smart to uh, what a sham his his kind of uh, branding and and uh, social media and and viral you know moments uh, all that stuff uh, people were kind of cottoning on to the fact that it was a very thinly veiled kind of PR campaign to uh, paper over some of his more uh, you know terrible policies. So now Jacinda Ardern has kind of become that figure for you know people around the world who can who who want especially in the U.S. who want to look to a a liberal leader somewhere in the world uh, to kind of forget Trump and, and go, you know, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had this? Right. I believe she wrote a, an op-ed for the New York Times after the Christchurch massacre. And I can recall the response to that being like wistful longing for somebody like her uh, to be in charge of sort of like emergency response were something of that sort to happen in the U S yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. Um, but you know, I would also, I would also warn, uh, Americans, uh, you know, I'm not in any way saying our donors as bad as Trudeau, but, uh, you know, also, you know, have a little skepticism, uh, just in our donors, also a politician. Uh, she's by no means perfect. There's a lot of criticism from the left of her in New Zealand. Uh, so, you know, uh, just because you you might read and see a lot of things that, that look good, there's, there's always a little more to the story than you might assume. And she also gave birth while in office, right? Which I know a lot of people found impressive. Yes, yes, she did. She, uh, I think she became pregnant uh, like very soon after she won the election. Um, and yeah, she gave birth, which is obviously an incredibly difficult thing to do anyway, uh, let alone when you're running a country. Um, you know, uh, unsurprisingly, or maybe surprisingly to some people, the country did not fall apart while she was, uh, you know, off giving birth. Uh, and our deputy prime minister ran the country. It was totally fine. Nothing terrible happened. Um, so, you know, ho hopefully if that, if that's a sort of example for the rest of the world to take up that, you know, we, you know, it's possible for women to not just, uh, lead an office, but to, uh, to, to, you know, give birth in office. So yeah, it's probably a positive thing, I think. Although, you know, I have to say also Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan did it first. So oh, credit with Chris, you. I, yeah, I, yeah, I she did. hadn't realized that. Um, anyway, I sort of interrupted you when you were sort of giving the backstory as to your interest in U.S. politics from a somewhat anomalous perspective, at least geographically. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, I I don't know where it came from. I mean, I, I learned about American history in my last year of high school. I found it really fascinating that, you know, that, that I think was part of it. I had two uh, very great uh, teachers, professors in university who were American, and then they taught American history at uh, Auckland University, who really kind of uh, nurtured students' interest in the subject, um, and uh, you know, I ended up for when I went into into grad school, I ended up focusing on um, U.S. history as part of my as, as well as part of my as my focus. 
Um, and that's sort of where I guess it sort of began. I mean, I'd always kind of obviously kept track of what was happening in the U.S. The U.S. is one of the uh, more consequential countries in the world, I would <laughs> I would say I think that's a pretty uncontroversial point. Well, I mean, um, the, thing, I, the thing that you mentioned about most Americans not being aware that their political affairs are followed pretty closely around the world actually has a foreign policy element to it because Americans are also not aware that the United States is like the world's leading military power and has a military portfolio that spans literally the entire world. And, you know, that is... Ignorance, and I'm not even necessarily rendering judgment on people who are ignorant. It's difficult to keep track of all this. Um, but if you are not even familiar with that function of your government, then it might not occur to you that it would be of interest to people elsewhere. So I think it's sort of like it's interesting when you put it that way. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I I know this fact tends to get kind of overstated sometimes, but I I do think that uh, a lot of Americans, because they don't travel tons outside the U.S., and again, you know, this is a very big generalization, and there's lots of reasons for it, but I think part of that kind of limits people's perspective. And you know, I mean, I can understand that the U.S. is a massive country, um, and uh, you know, it's the size of a continent by itself, and uh, obviously there's uh, countries on either side of it uh, as well. Uh, so you know, kind of going beyond North America may not seem like uh, even even necessary. But um, you know, whereas I think uh, for a country like New Zealand and you know, very much uh, like Australia as well. Uh, because we're we well, one we're small, but also the second thing is because we're shunted all the way, you know, on the sort of far corner of the world, away, away from where all the action is happening. Um, there, there is this kind of cultural drive to to travel outside of our countries and 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 go and go to different places and and live elsewhere and kind of see the world. And I think that maybe uh, imbues uh, New Zealanders with, with a little more consciousness that they're kind of uh, part of the world, but not the world if that makes sense right because i mean you could you could spend your entire life as a u.s citizen trying to see just the totality of what exists in the u.s never be able to do it right so yeah it, you know so like that's actually something that i've aspired to do meaning i visited pretty much every corner of the con of the of the u.s with the exception of hawaii uh, which i will do at some yeah. point um but you know, I, I the, the notion of being well traveled within the U.S. is something that I think maybe doesn't occur to you if you're from New Zealand, for example, because there's just so much to see, especially if you want to cover American politics. I mean, it varies regionally, as you know. Um, mm. And so, you know, you want to get a lay of the land as comprehensively as possible, which sort of in a way precludes even entertaining becoming well traveled abroad um at least that's how it's sort of worked so far in my experience although i'm going to try to rectify that at some point yeah i mean absolutely it's a it's a massive country there's uh huge cultural and social and political differences within different regions within, within different states sometimes inside uh, of different states um so yeah i mean and, and the amount of stuff to see i mean i i cannot say that i've remotely traveled through uh, most of, uh, or even a, a large fraction of the U.S. Um, but even that, you know, um, the, the, there's like, even when you go on one trip, for example, there are like a hundred things that you would want to see that, that you want to come back to. But then, you know, if you, if you do that, you've got every other corner of the country that you have to get to. So, yeah, I, you know, that, I think that that might be part of the reason why uh, the statistic about Americans, you know, whatever percentage has known passports. I think that might be part of it. I mean, the yeah, the U.S. is. I mean, you could you can maybe t tell me this for sure, but I mean, it's it's bigger than Europe physically. I think, right? Uh, I, if you include Alaska, for sure. I'm not exactly 100 right. percent sure on the on the continental U.S., but I mean, Alaska is like a mini continent in its own right. Right, it's, it's kind of insane if you you know compare it on a map with uh, the rest of the u.s land mass um but but yeah it's uh it's an enormous undertaking to even think that it's within your capacity to really understand the full range of political sentiments and at least in my case um in in the u.s so that's why you know 
traveling abroad, although I've done it a little bit, but it hasn't has been on much of my hasn't been on my radar as much as it might be if I had grown up in a place like New Zealand. Right. Yeah, yeah, which I think is fair. Um and you know, I'm that that's basically how I got my start in, in journalism uh in general, but also in the US as I, I traveled and I, I lived in the US for uh a year or so. And um and yeah, I ended up sort of just uh getting into journalism that way. So it's kinda of funny in many ways I'm uh kind of, I, I know more people and I'm better known in the US than I am in my own home country, which is <laughs> kind of a hilarious uh situation to be in. Well, if you ever write a memoir, that should be like the the animating theme where you sort of try to understand the implications of that for your life trajectory or something. Yeah, yeah. I'm a man without a home. <laughs> right. <sort> of, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> windswept across the world. And you live in the U.S. now, right? Uh, I'm actually in Canada uh, oh, okay. at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, in, in Toronto. Got it. All right, All right, so let's uh, let's do some foreign policy here, uh, vis-a-vis the mm. presidential campaign. Um, I'm, just, I guess, just start with a broad question. What do you think is sort of like the main axis of disagreement now, at least among the leading contenders in the foreign policy domain? I mean, to the extent that foreign policy has really even been at the forefront of the debate, which it kind of hasn't, which is sort of another fault Mm. of the process. But you'd think, like, as we mentioned before, the country of the world's most powerful military, in fact, the most powerful military in world history, um, would have that higher up on the agenda. But but there's not. I mean, there's all kinds of clamor for uh, climate change debates and other issue-specific debates, which is all well and good. um, But there's not much of a constituency to have a foreign policy debate because it kind of maybe raises some un- uncomfortable questions for certain people. <laughs> um, mm. But yeah, it does recede into the uh, background a bit. Well, there's definitely been, you know, uh, American liberals, uh, and this goes back to, uh, you know, well before Trump, uh, I've, I've sort of always not cared that much about foreign policy. Um, th- they have, uh, say, during the Bush years, um, although... You know, once Obama basically just continued Bush's policies, it kind of – you couldn't help but assume that uh, maybe uncharitably that a lot of the reason that people cared about foreign policy during Bush's uh, two terms is because they didn't like Bush and it was an effective way to attack him. Um, maybe that's unfair, but um, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, th- I, I, would, I would argue for that, but, you know. I think it's uh, fair. That's I think it's fair. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> But, um, well, I mean, because it goes back yeah, to the question, I mean, like, where, what happened to the, the quote-unquote anti-war movement when Obama took office? It just totally dissipated, which lends some credence to your, your theory. Yeah, I mean, uh, that actually, there, there was a book uh, or a kind of study, a book-length study that was done about this um, by an author whose name I can't remember. I actually, I've interviewed him and I've, I've read the book. Um, and that's basically the point that he makes, which is that the uh, Democratic Party basically co-opted the anti-war energy that was happening uh, on the ground over Bush, and they kind of funneled it into first their um, their, their midterm victories in, in 2006, uh, which were, of course were kind of undercut because they it was a huge wave election, and they ended up uh, because of Rahm Emanuel uh, re- recruiting a bunch of right-wing Democrats, uh, you know, blue dogs who obviously are very pro-military, pro-intervention. Um, and then, of course, uh, again, under Obama, Obama campaigned as an anti-war candidate. Uh, that was one of the main things to do with his uh, candidacy, why people liked him. It certainly wasn't healthcare. He didn't have a healthcare policy uh, for a while. Um, well, but, he did have you know, a healthcare policy. Things. Sorry to interject, but it's funny, actually, to think about this in hindsight. He did have a healthcare policy. It was a little bit underdeveloped. But the crux of his dispute with Hillary Clinton on healthcare policy in 2008 was that she wanted an individual mandate and he did not. And they sort of were at each other's throats for several months over that pretty narrow distinction that ended up being utterly meaningless because Obama care included the image, the, the uh, individual mandate regardless. So like the, the, the entire healthcare debate that transpired over many months in the 2008 primary cycle ended up just being negated and was like much ado about nothing uh the democrats uh yeah um yeah and just to clarify what i meant was just uh uh 
I, I don't know the exact time period, but it was it was when there was still I think John Edwards in the race, and um, for a while Obama didn't really have any clear cut health policy, and then it became this big flashpoint, and he sort of had to take it up. Right, Ryan Grimm writes about this in his uh, his recent book. But you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, during the debates the between uh, Obama and Clinton, that was a major flashpoint, which. <laughs> it didn't matter uh, whatsoever, ultimately. Um, but you know, for, for it, it, it would have it would have been a little boring to say we'll just figure it out once Congress takes over. Like that wouldn't have lent <laughs> yeah. itself to a really heated debate over the course of like yeah, right. twenty six televised you know forums and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, saying like, uh, well, listen, I'll have to figure this out once I've talked to all the representatives from the uh, health insurance industry. I'm not totally yeah. sure. We have to, uh, we have to <laughs> wait for Joe doing. Lieberman to weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but, you know. Which I'm is still, like literally uh, what happened. I mean, Joe Lieberman killed the public option. I mean, maybe yeah, maybe yeah. The, pe- the people listening don't recall this because they're too young or whatever. But, you know, Joe Lieberman is not, is regarded as a villain for good reason, because he like almost single handedly vetoed the public option from the ultimate Obamacare bill as a condition of, yeah. of his of his support. <clears throat> Absolutely, and and you know, uh, and his son is now running. For, his son is now running for senator. Uh, Obama didn't. Uh, the the, president, the the administration didn't punish him. They could have punished him by taking away, a, a, you know, a, his place in a committee or down down ranking him, but they didn't. Um, they just kind of let him, <laughs> let him destroy it, which maybe suggests that they weren't really that committed to, um, you know, a more robust healthcare reform anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, besides that, I mean, the thing that really made people excited about Obama, that, that was the main point of difference between him and Clinton, um, besides this, this individual mandate thing was, uh, that Obama had, uh, voted or no, he hadn't voted, but he had opposed the Iraq war, um, uh, early on, uh, and obviously Hillary Clinton had voted for it. Uh, I think so had John Edwards. Obviously Joe Biden had. So yes, um, John had, that was John thing Edwards people... had, but John Edwards actually recanted that vote much quicker than anybody else. Um, not that right, it really right. matters that much in terms of his judgment during a pivotal moment, but he at least attempted to distinguish himself by relatively quickly repudiating the vote and saying it was a mistake, and etc. Whereas for Hillary, yeah, right. Hillary the, didn't the, admit it was a mistake until 2014. Right. So it took her 12 years, literally. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it wasn't clear until uh, 2014 whether it was a, right. whether it had gone wrong or not. So, when she know. just so happened to have uh, a new book coming out and was preparing for another presidential campaign. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh and I think, to be honest, I mean, even Obama's opposition to the Iraq war is overstated. Um, I, I can't remember where I read this, but um, th- there was indication that actually he he wasn't that anti the Iraq war. Um, I think he had told someone that actually if he had, uh, well, you know what, this is in, I, I remember where this is in. This is in um, a book that came out this year um, called A Crisis Wasted. Um, it's written by... Yeah, I know uh, the you know the book? Okay. So, and this guy, the guy who wrote it, he's a Democratic insider, um, long time. You know, he was a Clinton a Clinton guy. He was involved in a transition. And he talks about how he remembers interviewing Obama, um, I, I think it was in 2004 or 2005 or something. And Obama basically said to him that, you know, like, uh, if, if he had been in Congress when the vote had actually been up, he probably would have voted for the Iraq war. So, you know, Obama's, Obama got lucky because he did oppose it. Um, publicly eventually and and he was able to you know he didn't he didn't have to have a vote which um, which which left him able to avoid kind of making a, a tough decision there you know does he does he go for the right thing or does he kind of join in the rest of the crowd and, and vote for the Iraq war Hillary Clinton Biden all these other guys um, they they didn't have that choice they didn't have that luxury they had to vote uh, and they voted poorly obviously yeah um, but uh, I think you, you asked me. <laughs> we're on a very uh, long tangent there, but you that's okay. We're on. A, we're on. A, we're we're doing a ra- we we do with we do things in a roundabout manner on this this podcast. So it's, okay, that's it's good. Totally fine. Um. So well, uh, to to answer your question, yeah. um, I I think you know, uh, I think the candidates realize that the U.S. public has a lot less tolerance for. Uh, foreign interventions, or at least, you know, sort of out and out uh, foreign interventions. Um, people are still 
uh, happy if there's, you know, special forces being deployed around the world that they don't hear about. But um, certainly, yeah, you know, actual wars, I think, I think there's a sense that the American public is, is tired of all this kind of thing. Um, so I think that that isn't as much of a point of differentiation anymore. I think, you know, even so, pretty much every candidate is now talking about withdrawing from Afghanistan, um, although there is – there's obviously difference there between um, candidates about how fast they would withdraw, whether they leave forces behind, and so on and so forth. Um, I think one of the big and it, there's, a, there's also a difference in terms of how committal they are in terms of like a timeline. Would a residual force be left, which are all kind of like weasel words to basically just continue the status quo? Because Obama had also ostensibly committed to withdrawing from Afghanistan and it didn't ultimately matter because there was enough of a quote unquote residual force left behind that you could just as easily do a surge and then it's like nothing happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but I would say that the other major difference that's really shape, shaping up, um, is between, you know, different camps of candidates is, uh, is the issue of Israel. I mean, that, Support U.S. support for Israel has really been non-negotiable for um, decades, and we are starting to finally see uh, some some actual daylight creeping in here. Uh, obviously, I think it's most dramatic with Sanders. Sanders is the only candidate that has uh, said that he would condition uh, U.S. aid to Israel um, or use it as a kind of point of leverage to change their behavior. Um, I know some other candidates have said similar things, like Pete Burgage in his answer to the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. He said, that, you know, he would consider maybe cutting some of the aid if uh, if uh, Israel annexed the West Bank. But that, you know, that's a far um, – I would say that's a far different uh, policy than what Sanders is talking about, which is actually uh, whether they annex the West Bank or not. Uh, using the aid as a sort of uh, way to make Israel change its behavior, maybe um, sit down to talks, you know, uh, who knows what else. So I think that's a really big thing. You know, you look at the Democratic electorate right now, um, people are more, uh, the Democratic voting population anyway is more on the side of Palestinians than it has been in a very long time. It's increasingly not viewed as politically risky to speak out against Israel and, and the actions of Israel's government. Um, obviously, you know, there's pushback on this, uh, as we know from the uh, from the stuff with Ilan Omar and the quote-unquote squad. Uh, they've <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. Um, but they, they've received. Thank you for inserting squ- scare quotes there. <laughs> But yeah, they they've received a lot of pushback, obviously, uh, from the the right and the uh, center, the so-called center. Um, so the, the, it's not like this question is settled or anything. But um, I think that you can you can see the candidates uh, increasingly uh, bolder in terms of criticizing Israel. Um, you know, and, th- and, you, and know you know, what? I mean, I think part of that comes down to donors. I, I really think a lot of the candidates are just worried about, regardless of what they believe. Um, and even if they see that things are changing, at least in, in voter attitudes, I think they are kind of wary of alienating, um, you know, donors who view Israel as uh, as one of their big issues. You know, one thing I wonder about that is if Netanyahu is forced from office, which is far from certain, um, he may be able to put together a government. We don't know. Um, but if. Netanyahu is no longer in the picture and you had a more centrist or even center left. I don't know exactly how one would describe Gantz um, Mm. ideologically, but at least less to the right than Netanyahu at minimum. I sort of wonder how that would factor into how the Democratic candidates speak about Israel, because usually they reserve their ire for Netanyahu specifically because they can tie him to Trump. They can tie him to like right wing movements globally. Right They're, They can use him as sort of a stand in so as mm. to not necessarily question some of the underlying premises of how the state has operated for ever, essentially. Um, so I, I kind of wonder how their if their rhetoric would soften if somebody who was a little more amenable became prime minister right 
Yeah, I think that's a good question because, uh, I mean, you know, obviously, at least based on what I understand, uh, Gantz isn't really that different from Netanyahu, at least in foreign policy. I mean, he's he's just as kind of right wing and, and militaristic, maybe maybe with a few little changes here and there, but basically it's the the same uh, same policy. But you're right in that um, there there would probably be a uh, a tendency to to maybe not really acknowledge this or even see this because uh, you know he's he's liberal in other fronts and therefore you know people just sort of assume that he must be liberal uh, also when it comes to how he you know what what is uh, what his position is on, on treating Palestinians um, so yeah that that pressure could could evaporate away um, depending on what happens but so I guess we'll have to see but I, I think there still is even even Though Netanyahu is the face of um, of Israel right now and has been for a long time, and, and obviously is this kind of very blatantly kind of villainous face, um, I, I think that all it would take is you know yet another kind of um, crisis, you know another another instance of, of uh, Israeli soldiers murdering journalists and, um, and and maiming people by shooting them in the legs, killing you know unarmed protesters, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, I think people would sort of realize that no matter who you, uh, swap out as a leader of Israel, that, uh, th- this particular element of its policy is kind of basically going to stay, stay the same. Mm. Um, and then you go ahead. Well, and just, just to finish on that, I think the last thing I'll say that, that I've seen as a kind of emerging distinction is, um, uh, Warren and Sanders have both uh, been critical of the war on terror. Uh, Sanders of that speech, I think, 2017, where he um, he basically just uh, he said the war on terror was a failure. He criticized kind of every every element of it that we basically had to you know change course and do something completely different. Um, Warren Warren hasn't gone quite as far as he has, but she's um, said things along those lines that basically you know just bombing people into oblivion forever and ever is not really a sustainable or effective solution to what is happening in the world. Um, and I haven't seen that from a lot of the other candidates. Um, I can't think of anyone really who has articulated that. So I think that's another difference. How important it's going to be in the election, I can't say. Like you said, foreign policy hasn't really come up as a particularly um, big topic uh, in this election, despite the fact that obviously the U.S. president has more power to shape foreign policy than anything else. So we'll see. You know, I think it's one thing. I, I know the speech that you're referring to from Sanders in 2017, but at least in terms of your paraphrase of the Warren comment, I sort of wonder how to uh, think about that, because it's one thing to say, you know, we can't keep up bombing our way out of problems for in, in perpetuity, but it's another to say we are going to cease bombing these particular locales like Somalia, for example, which we've been bombing regularly for years. I don't know that you would necessarily get a commitment from Warren or perhaps even Sanders to refrain from all bombing of a particular country because it's futile, right? I think that I think it's much easier yeah. to talk about it in the abstract. Whereas there's always going to be somebody who says, oh, if a certain terrorist or something shows up in Mogadishu on the outskirts somewhere, you got to bomb them, right? So uh, it's, a, mm. it's, a, it's a little bit more uh, difficult when you, when you get into specifics. And I think what tends to be done is that specifics are avoided in foreign policy so you, the candidates can give themselves as much latitude as possible when they're actually – in a power in in a a position of power uh to to make those decisions yeah i think that's right uh i think that whatever president ends up being elected uh you know uh, presumably a non-trump president i think whoever they are they'll probably there there will have to be some significant pushback and and um challenged by uh you know the the left uh but hopefully not just the left uh people in general who are committed to uh, ending wars and ending kind of the senseless slaughter of people around the world. Um, because I think it's one of those things that it's just very easy to not do anything about if you're president. Um, it's very easy, especially when you're hearing, you know, uh, all manner of kind of scare stories from people in the military about, you know, what will happen if you, oh, if you stop 
you know, uh, if you if you start yeah, bombing Somalia or like uh, if you get rid of that air base in Djibouti or like whatever, it's very easy to um, to just listen to that and go, well, you know, I'm getting pushback from there. I'm not getting pushback from anyone else. I'm not getting pushback from my voters. So why am I going to take a political risk and actually get rid of this stuff? So, yeah, I think uh, whoever gets elected, even if it's Sanders, even if he has promised to sort of change or reorient away from the war on terror, which I think is genuine. But um, again, the realities, the political realities, uh, something that can that can come in and, and basically uh, grind those efforts to a halt. And people have to keep holding their, their feet to the fire on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the the lack of specificity is most conspicuous with Warren, who, although she has made some commitments here and there, like she has been as clear as you could be, I would think that um, she favors withdrawing troops from Afghanistan immediately, although she, of course, wants to leave some be- behind some kind of like, I think she said she wants to leave behind. I have the quote here. Hold on a second. Oh, she said, we should redouble our efforts to support the Afghan government and civil society as they were to promote the rule of law, combat corruption, and the narcotics trade, which reads to me that she's going to leave behind some combat troops because if you want U.S. forces to be involved in all those functions, it was would probably necessarily entail some form of combat at some point, right? If you want, if like you're, if you're, uh, you know, saying that it's 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 within the U.S. purview to combat the narcotics trade. I mean, do you think that? The narcotics trade is conducted with, you know, flowers and bunny rabbits. No, I mean, <laughs> that's probably going to entail probably the exchange of gunfire at some point. Right. Yeah. And um, I mean, Warren's climate plan or part of a climate plan, which was basically just to um, to kind of greenify the military, but essentially maintain the uh, the huge presence that the U.S. has overseas, um, which is a far greater contributor to climate change than, you know, the fact that bases and stuff aren't green. Um, I think that sort of suggests that she, um, it's probably not something that she's going to really be looking at uh, too much. I mean, you know, you can look at some some previous uh, previous votes and, and people's record. I mean, Sanders voted against John Brennan, uh, of course, uh, who was famous uh, for basically, you know, being the, the, the kind of architect of Obama's drone policy. Um, Warren did vote for him. Um, you know, I'm not saying that that means that Sanders is going to uh, do a radical turn away from from the existing drone policy. And in, in fact, if uh, you read some of his public statements, it seems clear that he's going to maintain. Um, uh, that's definitely what he said in 2016. You know, I haven't seen anything uh, that, that says otherwise that he wouldn't keep it going. Um, uh, Brennan, by the way, he, also the architect of uh, RussiaGate, arguably, but that's another <laughs> issue. Yes, very much. If not the architect, I would say certainly one of the um, the main kind of uh, prime movers uh, proponents. Yeah, the, the one of the main propagandists, kind of yeah, going on CNN and and other shows and and pushing that narrative for, for many years. Uh, which, yeah, I would say that there's <laughs> there's an interesting connection there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so I think uh, I think with when it comes to to that kind of thing. I mean, yeah, probably all of the, the candidates have been super specific. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I do think Sanders has gone further than the other ones. And again, people have to make sure that he actually lives up to his word. But if, if he really is intent on taking on climate change, I mean, it's just in, in, indisputable. The U.S. cannot maintain the massive global footprint it has now and uh, and actually uh, get where we need to be when it comes to carbon emissions. You were actually fairly critical in much of what you wrote about Sanders in terms of foreign policy uh, during and I think and then after I think the uh, the 2016 campaign. I actually have a quote from one of your 2017 pieces. You said that his quote relative silence on Obama's foreign policy has mirrored his fairly conventional foreign policy thinking throughout his Washington career, and you contrasted that with Jeremy Corbyn, who you think thought was a more ideal uh, exemplar of how to challenge convention in the foreign policy Mm. arena i mean do you think that you think that that 2017 speech which i think came later and other subsequent developments have sort of uh cut against what you said there in in 2017 or or how do you think about it now 
Yeah, yeah, I uh, I definitely feel far less harshly towards him on foreign policy now. Um, not just because of that speech, but uh, you know, you had some of the stuff like uh, his his role, really the leading role in making the um, the war powers vote uh, on Yemen happen. Uh, that was a really big thing. Uh, I think not just because it showed that he had uh, grown and perhaps seen that there was uh, political space for him to to go back to his more kind of anti-war roots. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things I will say, I was a little unfair about him in that in that original piece was that I didn't talk about some of the uh, very good stances he took, you know, uh, over uh, the Reagan administration's Nicaragua policy, for example, and, and other elements of U.S. foreign policy right. during the 80s, which I think is, is when important he was to in, know. When he was in a municipal role, granted. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Which, are, yeah, so very, very different, very different set of pressures there, um, of course. Uh, and the fact that he kind of went more towards the center once he went into a more national role, I think, showed that ultimately, you know, his priority wasn't as much foreign policy um, as some of the, the, the more domestic stuff. But I think he has been showing, if nothing else, as a, as a kind of point of distinction between him and some of the other candidates, and, and maybe also to kind of show that he is able to work uh, within the system um, to get things done. He has shown more uh, proclivity to kind of more anti-war, anti-interventionist uh, stances. And, you know, I mean, the, the vote against John Brown, I think, um, I think is significant. I think it does tell us that even even Sanders' worst um, still uh, still has an understanding of, you know, what the correct foreign policy should be, even if he may need um, – some nudging uh, from from uh, the left and other groups to get there, um, but yeah, I I I, don't, I think he has he's done a lot better. I think you know the hiring of Matt Duss, for example, uh, right. is a really good indication of where he wants to go in foreign policy. Um, I think the other thing, the thing that really impresses me with Sanders in foreign policy is, and I I have not seen any other candidate say this. As as far as I know, he's the only one who's actually articulated this. Sanders is the only person that seems to recognize the reality of. The world that we're looking at right now, which is there's a world that is being increasingly divided by um, by kind of neoliberal authoritarians, whether it's Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, Orban, Netanyahu, and you know so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, Boris Johnson in the UK, although how how exactly he would he would govern on the world stage, uh, we haven't really gone to to fully see because uh, the Brexit debacle has kind of dominated that. Um, but you know, Sanders really recognizes that. He sees that there's a really dangerous uh, global movement, and he, and he understands the need to make international linkages to fight against that. Um, you know, obviously, Sanders and Corbyn have a a uh, not not necessarily an intimate relationship, but they have a relationship. Uh, I think they they see each other as kind of um, uh, kind of fighting for the same common cause. I think it's a little bit uh, overstated, though. And I mean, I, I get the point, and I think there's something to it, obviously. But, and this is something that you actually hear espoused often in the media and, and other discussions uh, on, on just the international scene. But something has always sort of irked me about this sort of easy conflation of political phenomena as discrepant as a Bolsonaro and a Trump and a Boris Johnson. I, I mean, I, I, it, it seems like those are just the people who have to be in power. And it's suitable for narrative purposes to kind of put them into this same sort of nebulous category of neoliberal authoritarianism, which I think admittedly is a little bit vague. Um, I don't know. Something about that seems like a little bit of an oversimplification to me, which doesn't preclude taking steps internationally to forge certain alliances to combat some of the more, uh, you know, maybe noxious developments um but I don't know, some, something doesn't that doesn't about that doesn't sit quite right with me well i mean we can argue about the labels uh but i think it's pretty uh inco- incontrovertible that you know a guy like bolsonaro and trump for example i mean the, these are th- that, that was a very similar phenomenon uh, taking place in both countries which is you've got governments well, glenn, glenn greenwald vociferously denies that there are uh meaningfully similar at least in the way that a lot of u.s pundits try to assert but anyway well they're they're different in this sense which is that bolsonaro i think is personally a far more committed right-wing counter-revolutionary um and and someone who is far more 
actually committed to being uh, an authoritarian or, or even a despot. Uh, Trump, Trump, I think, kind of like flails around. But in both cases, you do have governments that are staffed with people um, whose goal at various times has been to basically roll back um, the tide of the left uh, in, in both North and South America. Um, you know, I mean, the Trump, what he was trying to do in Venezuela didn't work out, but, you know, it's no surprise that the people <laughs> who are trying this stuff on the pre previous presidents uh, are in the Trump. And I think a more concerning um, uh, development and, and commonality, uh, commonality between those two guys is that you have, in both cases, this is a basically a... a neoliberal government that is attempting to um it's one it takes a very kind of uh violent uh uh, uh approach to to say uh, minorities in those countries but i think uh secondly it's also really just trying to plunder the world's resources you know at, at a very precarious moment um when we are rapidly running out of time to uh forge a a, a worldwide uh, united effort to, to combat the easily the greatest uh, threat that humanity has ever faced on, on, on this earth. Um, and both of them are basically just throwing logs onto the fire, throwing logs and gasoline onto the fire uh, that they do not care about, that they're they just sort of trying to exploit as much as possible in these last dwindling moments before we can actually get together and, and do something about it. So I think that's a really important point. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, is... I don't know if you describe Netanyahu in the same way, but obviously Netanyahu, he, he you know, he can see which side of the bread, uh, side, side his bread is bad on. He's he's trying to make alliances with, the, with these guys, um, and I think uh, even if even if Netanyahu doesn't have the same kind of ecocidal motives as um, as the Trump and Bolsonaro governments does. Um, I think uh, he does realize that he can make common cause with these guys. Um, that you know, they they see the world in a in a similar way, and um, and also that he can he can get protection from them um, around you know, especially in a world that is rapidly turning it, turning it against the Israeli government. So I think it's important to realize that. And I and I think to be honest, other than Sanders' few speeches I've seen on this, I I don't know if anyone even realizes this. I don't know if anyone realizes that that. You know, the the only way that we're actually going to solve the climate crisis, which which, as far as I'm concerned, should be the organizing principle of uh, not just U.S. foreign policy, but but global foreign policy. The only way we're going to get through it is if if we find a way to deal with um, people like Bolsonaro and, and Trump and you know uh, Scott Morrison in Australia, for example, who isn't isn't a kind of authoritarian or anything, but um, very much in the same vein as kind of just this. this uh, you know, late stage kind of neoliberal plunderer. So um, I, I wish that I wish that this was talked about more than you know. Oh, Iran might get a nuclear weapon, which you know, if Iran had a nuke, it would not change anything. It, it really wouldn't. I mean, one nuke, Israel has something like three hundred. Um, although we don't know because Israel's totally secret about what how many nukes it has and what its capabilities are. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is the biggest threat, and I, I wish that we talked about it more um, in, in the in the discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, one more point on on Sanders. I actually went back and watched a couple uh, segments from the 2016 primaries that were foreign policy focused between Hillary and Bernie, and I hadn't remembered this, but at a certain point when. Hillary at least began to perceive Bernie as something of a threat such that she had to formulate talking points and arguments to counter him. She began saying that although it was true that she did vote for the 2002 Iraq war authorization, Bernie had voted for the Iraq Liberation Act in 1998, which was then cited as part of the justification for the the war resolution and i hadn't realized that she had actually been talking about that and it's it's actually not a bad point um and it it goes to the sort of critis critique that you were laying out at least in 2017 about him in the earlier part of his career kind of being somewhat ensconced ensconced in, in conventional wisdom foreign policy wise where he apparently didn't perceive that passing such an act, meaning the Iraq Liberation Act, which essentially codified a call for regime change in terms of U.S. the U.S. code, um, 
uh, could be used later on, you know, in this case, just four years later to, to, to uh, initiate a war. Um, so t- to me, that's actually one of the, the more glaring examples that if you're not familiar with the history, you might not uh, be aware of. Yeah, uh, I think that is a, a really important thing. Um, and, you know, obviously, when Sanders says that you know, he, he, he led the effort against the Iraq war, obviously that's, that's a slightly incomplete record. There's, there's more to it than that. I do think that there is a major difference between passing that act, even as, as significant as it, as it was, don't get me wrong. I think there is a difference between that and then in 2002, uh, you know, in, in an administration that had made very clear that our policy is, is going to be th- getting rid of Saddam. And, and we are, this is the thing that we are focusing on. We're going to launch a, a very sophisticated campaign to try and get everyone on board. And when it actually comes down to voting for the authorization for that war, you know, whether you vote yes or no, I think that is an important distinction. Oh, sure. It's obviously um, an important distinction. I'm yeah. just saying that at least the narrow point that Hillary was making there in trying to, in some sense, implicate Bernie in the, in the policy trajectory that led to the vote had some validity to it, even if it didn't at all compare with her role, which was hugely significant in her uh, capacity well, in the Senate. Yeah, well, you know, this shows you how uh, things have changed since um, since even, even you know, 2015, 2016, uh, which is that I think Sanders didn't really care that much about foreign policy or at least he didn't think it was anything that was worth focusing on i think he just wanted to kind of get his message about inequality and corruption and and you know climate change and everything else out there and i think uh the increased one i think the fact that trump uh won uh the republican nomination on the back of you know disingenuous but nonetheless um the kind of anti-war rhetoric criticizing Bush and criticizing uh, the Iraq war. And at one point even saying that, you know, Libya was a mistake, even though we know that he, he said at the time that it was the right thing to do. But nonetheless, uh, this is what people you know, thought about him. This is what he was saying um, when he was most visible uh, on the, in the public uh, arena uh, to a lot of people. And I think the fact that, that he won by that, and, and you know, by the way, there's a study that, that was done in, I think, 2017 or 2018 that um, looked at some of these counties that Trump had won in, in those key uh, uh, blue states that had, that had switched. Um, and a lot of those places had uh, kind of a, a much or markedly higher number of uh, people who had died, uh, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan, um, which may may have been part of the thing that, that – turn people away from Clinton towards Trump. Who knows? But I think all of that, um, coupled with a renewed uh, role for the left in U.S. public life, I think all that has given Sanders, um, one, it's not just been like a, it's been a hint to be like, hey, this is something that you should take seriously and focus on. And, and this is important. And I think it's also uh, given him the space to kind of uh, go and kind of really pursue a much more anti-interventionist foreign policy and, and, and make these critiques of, you know, I mean, he now always puts the military industrial complex as part of his kind of, um, uh, stump speech list of, of enemies that he's taking on. Um, so, you know, I mean, again, it, it just shows leaders are important, but also you, there has to be a, a wider, uh, movement that's kind of, kind of, uh, behind them and, and, and forcing them to do what they need to do. One thing that frustrates me is that Bernie will uh, occasionally bring up that Biden voted for the Iraq war. and He contrasts that to his leading the opposition, as he calls it, <clears throat> which is essentially the same thing he said about Hillary in the previous cycle. And I just don't know how salient of an attack that is anymore with so much time having passed. What I think ought to be said, and you've written on this, is that Biden is just blatantly misrepresenting his role in 2002, 2003 in the run-up to the Iraq war. Not only did he vote for the war, he held hearings that essentially bolstered the Bush administration's case uh, for the war in the Senate. He repeated many of the talking points that were coming out of the administration. I actually interviewed him couple like a month or so ago now in new hampshire and he claimed to me personally that he opposed the or, or the war before it began 
So he had said at one point that he opposed it like shortly after or like maybe, you know, right away. Uh, but then he, he kind of changed his story to me and said that he opposed it before, which is like just so easily falsifiable. It's crazy. So I kind of wish Sanders and others would not just let him get get away with saying that he voted for the war and maybe it wasn't a great idea, but that he's distorting the history and misrepresenting what his role was now. So not in 2002, but currently. Yeah, I mean, I would love to hear that interview um, because uh, this is also one of my frustrations. It's that uh, I, I don't understand why they're not calling that out. I, you know, well, yeah, it's very possible they haven't read my piece. Um, but, uh, you know, well, if, it, if any Sanders person or, or, you know, any other candidate is listening to this, uh, you know, read the piece and then, and then ask Biden about it. Or, or you can read my piece on Biden, too, where I document what he said. Was, there we go. So there we go. Some, yeah, so we can help out. Come to us. We'll help. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because you're you're right. Uh, the way that it's presented now, um, and all the candidates, whether they realize it or not, they're kind of uh, feeding into into this lie, is that Biden. It, it sounds like he was just sort of in the Senate when this came up for a vote, and he was kind of you know agonizing. Oh, what do I do? What do I do? And he decided that he would vote for it, and you know it was a mistake. Whoops. Uh, you know, the uh, shit happens sometimes. Sometimes hundreds of thousands of civilians in another country die. Oops, a daisy. Um, I mean, that's already damning enough. But then you consider the fact if you if you actually look at Biden's utterance, uh, utterances, um, as, as you've alluded to, he was on the Sunday talk shows, basically repeating Bush rhetoric, uh, you know, about the need to get rid of uh, Saddam, how there, there was no uh, possible avenue for peace with Saddam, how the, the only only thing that could be done is to get rid of him. If he's there in five years, you know, that that's a big failure. He obviously voted for the Iraq war. Um, I mean, the idea that he opposed it just before it started is complete nonsense. He actually traveled around uh, Europe and the Middle East uh, a few months before the war started basically trying to gather support for the coming war effort. You know, he went to Israel, he went to Jordan. Jordan was not happy about um, about Bush's uh, plans to invade Iraq. So uh, Biden basically went there, um, on, I, I think, basically to, to kind of soothe things and, and try and get their buy-in on, on the coming invasion. He went to uh, – he went and talked to the uh, the Kurdish parliament, and he, he told them – you know, you have a friend in the U.S., you know, we're going to make sure that you're liberated, which is a pretty clear, you know, indication um, that that he knew that a war was coming. He also talked to... On the uh, day, sorry to interrupt, some, but, I, but I'm going to, this drives me crazy and I'm going to explode if I don't say it, but because sure, sure. on the day that Colin Powell gave his infamous address to the U.N. about weapons of mass destruction, Biden who at that point was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, gave a press conference. And that was a crucial moment because he supported everything that Colin Powell said without reservation. So he gave it a bipartisan endorsement, essentially. And not only that, he explicitly drew a connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. So like mm -hmm. the, the most egregious talking point that was being used to fearmonger Biden repeated at the most pivotal moment in the lead up to the war. So, you know, it just, again, that's why I said it's so easily falsifiable, the notion that he opposed it before it began, that it's almost preposterous. It is. And he, as uh, chairman of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee, also held hearings on Iraq and, and with it, it had weapons of mass destruction, which basically was just a unceasing uh, parade of kind of propaganda in favor of, of the war. Um, he left out key voices. You know, Scott Ritter, for example, wasn't invited to that. And Scott Ritter wrote about it. You know, he said that this is basically just going to give cover for any war effort. Um, and also the idea that he's been, he's been saying that, oh, well, you know, once the war was launched, I, I realized how bad it was. I, I immediately uh, took it back and I, I opposed it. I, I realized it was a mistake. Not true whatsoever. Uh, I, I don't know how long this lasted, but Suddenly, until about maybe August or September of 2003, he was still very much in support of the war. He was saying that any Democrat saying the opposite was was wrong. Um, you know, he criticized Howard Dean uh, on Fox News because Howard Dean was saying, you know, we have to pull out, yada, yada, yada. 
Um, and Biden was saying, uh, you know, no, no, that he does not speak for the Democratic Party. He was um, chastising any Democrat who at that point was suggesting a withdrawal and actually demanding that more troops be committed. Like his central criticism of the Bush administration at that point was that they weren't candid enough about how costly the war would be in terms of not just money, but manpower. So he wanted the Bush administration to be more transparent in the amount of resources that needed to be allocated. Like, and he wanted more. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, and very much castigating liberals and Democrats, kind of painting them as kind of out of touch and, and unrealistic, which is a classic career long uh, Biden move. And uh, to be fair to him, I will say that reportedly under uh, Obama, he sounded like he was the only voice of reason in that administration. He opposed Libya and, and um, he opposed going to Syria and, um, I, he he opposed the Bin Laden raid as well. Right. Um, I think he. I so, think he also. I think he opposed the Afghanistan surge in '09 as well. Okay, well there you go. Yeah. So so, so I mean, you know, you're right. Think, he was like he was the uh, he was the foil to Hillary Clinton, who was in the opposite direction right. on all those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, at the same time, you know, now he's he he's been backing uh, Guaido in Venezuela and saying that. Um, you know, the, the Maduro needs to be toppled there. And so, you know, it's, it's yes, uh, during the Obama administration, it sounds like he was uh, not quite as hawkish as the rest of them. But um, the thing about him is that you just, you just don't know. You really don't know. Uh, particularly, Biden has this thing where throughout his career, he kind of just gets swept up to, uh, up in any right-wing frenzy that kind of bubbles up, you know, whether it's, Right. Crime and drugs, or the the hysteria that that, that engulfed uh, U.S. culture after September 11, or um, the kind of uh, very uh, anti anti government spending, anti deficit uh, stuff that happened under Reagan, and kind of basically continued on from there. Um, he always kind of gets gets embroiled in these, and any he, he kind of his move is that he just takes it further than even the, the right does um, to kind of prove that he is just as tough and, you know, what have you serious, I guess. Uh, and then, so I, I mean, I think for me, the issue is if he became president, how long is it before something happens that, that creates another, you know, right wing friends, you know, whether, whether it's around invading Venezuela or God knows what, and he succumbs to it because he he's worried about the political fallout if he's uh, you know seen to be not right wing enough. He's also borderline senile, so who knows what kind of influence <laughs> can be exerted on him if he were actually in a position of power at this point. Yeah, which I mean, even that that's doubly scary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be that the the Biden who had learned his lesson from Iraq was like the the lucid Biden, you know, <laughs> and then this the one that we have now who's kind of still seems to be uh you know living in uh in a time that he was a, a lifeguard at that swimming pool um that biden may not uh remember the <laughs> lessons of the iraq war and some of these other wars that he supported right uh so you and i have had uh, exchanges about tulsi gabbard in the past i'm just curious if, if you followed her campaign uh, rhetoric much in the past couple months and if that has altered your relatively pessimistic view about her you know, for example i just watched a um a presentation that she made in uh, new hampshire uh two or three days ago and she was talking about how um she was somebody brought up nuclear weapons and she was talking about how dangerous it is that you the u.s nuclear weapon stockpile is still on hair trigger alert um which meaning that they could be launched in a matter of minutes and she actually advocated that they be taken off hair trigger alert, which is not something that you hear much discussed, um, but is obviously like existentially important, potentially. Um, so mm. it just seems to me like in, in following her pretty closely, she does cut against the grain and bring up issues that otherwise tend to get um, obscured, even if you don't agree with her uh, her approach uh, 100%. So so has anything modified your, your view on her? I think that uh, 
a lot of the stuff that she's brought to the table in this campaign has been good. Uh, that's one example. I think she was also one of the few, maybe the only one, um, to comment on the Julian Assange uh, arrest and basically say this is a, this is a bad thing. Uh, Bernie eventually did, that. but she was the most forceful and the uh, earliest. Right, right. Yeah, and, and very very quick off the mark, uh, which is good. The thing with, with Gabbard is I, I do not trust her. And, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that she has taken, um, she has moved to the left since 2016. Um, but she still basically says that she just wants to com continue Obama's foreign policy, which is just uh, do drone strikes and rely on special forces, um, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I mean, in the, the debate, one of the debates, she, uh, when they were talking about the Iran deal, she kind of called it a flawed deal, which is, a, you know, it's like almost like she's signaling to the right, because that's, that's a common talking point um, among the right. This is a, a flawed deal. Um, hers is a little she more nuanced. She did she support says, yeah, the deal. The best we have. She did support the deal. Though. She did well. She did eventually. I mean, she until she voted for it, she was not into it. She was very critical of it. She actually voted to increase uh, uh, sanctions, new sanctions on Iran once the uh, once Rouhani was was uh, elected, which uh, really undercut the the prospect for peace. I mean, it happened ultimately, but th this is not a thing that. Uh, anyone on the left, and even a lot of Democrats, were, were happy about them. You know, increasing sanctions on Iran at that point was a very sensitive time. Um, and she, and and she, she did eventually vote for it. That's true, but it came after a lot of stuff that was kind of in the opposite direction. And and that deal, the vote for that deal, did come after a lot of heavy lobbying from the Obama administration, because this is this is viewed as one of the administration's great uh, potential foreign policy accomplishments. So she kind of fell into line and she was very critical of the deal um, when she voted for it. So, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that that's necessarily disqualifying, but... Um, I, think taking... it's a, I think it's a little much to say that she would just continue the Obama administration's foreign policy when her signature issue, arguably, was opposition to what she regarded as an ill-fated regime change initiative that the Obama administration waged in Syria. So that's a key difference between her outlook and that of the Obama administration in Syria. I mean, uh, Libya would be another example. Um, you could go down the line. So uh, well, although she, she doesn't, it's true that she doesn't object on principle to every aspect of counterterrorism policy, but even even neither does Bernie notwithstanding some of the rhetorical adjustments he made in that 2017 speech. I mean, I can remember over the course of the 2016 campaign, and you actually mentioned this in one of your articles, where Bernie said that he could imagine using drone strikes against terrorists and that there are threats that need to be combated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I, think, I think just dismissing what she's advocating as a pure continuation of the Obama foreign policy is a little bit uncharitable. Well, I mean, the Obama administration, the, the Libya uh, debacle notwithstanding, which, by the way, the, what he did in Libya, he admitted that was a mistake and he because that was pretty much against his instincts. Um, not that that means that much at the end, but, you know, I don't, I don't know if that was like really the Libya thing was really part of any sort of Obama doctrine. I think even he really regretted that. Um, so I, I, you know, let, let's leave that for, for, for the side for a moment. But I mean, uh, accepting Libya, Obama's big thing was to uh, increase the presence of drones and the reach of drones around the world and increase the way that they use to uh, up the, the level of special forces, um, which, which, you know, even if you don't uh, declare war, uh, if you are sending special forces, which could be you know thousands of, of, of soldiers you know who know maybe even more um, that is still a war and that is still uh, imperialism by any stretch uh, stretch of the imagination it's not a war that Congress will vote on which in some ways makes it even um, even and even, even more dangerous um, and it's also a war that's going to be secret so there's very little public accountability. And she hasn't said anything that I've seen. Perhaps I'm wrong, but she hasn't said anything that that says that she's going to roll these things back. Um, well, I mean, I, mean I, did, can... I, I did, I did an inter I did interview her for this very podcast, and um, okay. she was she calling saying? for a more circumspect. It's true that she doesn't object to it entirely on principle, right? But she was calling for a far more circumspect approach, given it, the propensity for blowback, uh, etc. So. Would I 
personally prefer a more full-throated rejection of the entirety of the counterterrorism enterprise, sort of like on a more theoretical level, sure. Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't think it's fair to say that she's calling for it to be ramped up in the way that you suggest, or at least that's not what she's been saying for the past, since, since, since the campaign has been underway. Well, let me ask you this. Did you ask her if she still considers herself a hawk when it comes to terrorism? Because that's what she said in 2016. Right. I mean, we didn't get into that. Uh, I mean, maybe I, 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 I ought to have, I, I suppose. But she did speak about that in, with, in her interview with Glenn Greenwald. And by the way, I think it's notable, this is a little bit of a side issue, but she's the only mm. candidate who's like doing interviews with people like Glenn Greenwald and myself. Not that we're the best you know, not that we're like these shining examples of journalistic integrity or anything, but like, you know, she does a podcast with Matt Taibbi I and mean, she's like she actually has who I would regard to be um, positive influences insofar as like doing that kind of media is suggestive of, of influence. Um, so that gives me a little bit of a of a, uh, a more of an appreciation for who at least she regards as like within her sphere, you know, Um and uh, yeah, but, yeah, but anyway, I mean, that, that is encouraging. Yeah. And when she but when she um, was asked about that with with Greenwald, um, the, I mean, the way I've always interpreted that comment is that she's sort of inverting the typical notion of what a hawk means. Right. So the way that terrorism has been combated since 9-11 has had the consequence of actually inflaming terrorism in her mind and creating conditions whereby terrorism was more likely to come about, such as ISIS, Al Qaeda gaining more of a of a foothold um, in Syria and elsewhere. So she's actually saying that the the, the ha- quote unquote hawkish way to combat terrorism is the opposite of what's been done in terms of the predominant U.S. foreign policy paradigm. And she focuses on regime change principally. But the reason being, she feels as though that has fueled and fostered terrorism. And actually, if you want truly want to combat it, you have to change just the basic premises that underlie U.S. foreign policy. I mean, for example, she's she gave an interview with NPR in July, I believe. And she was asked, do you uh, think that any what U.S. foreign policy or what, what U.S. interventions do you think have been legitimate since uh, in, in in recent history, and she cited she said none since World War Two. <laughs> like so, none of right. no U.S. intervention since World War Two in her mind had been legitimate. I'm paraphrasing, um, mm. but I think it I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong to dismiss a candidate who would say something as relatively extreme in a positive way. I would say as that as uh, somebody who's just sort of like conventional and just wants to continue what the the liberal yeah. consensus was pre Trump. You know. Well, I mean, that is the liberal consensus. I mean, Obama would describe himself the same way. He'd say, I don't want to do more regime change. I think it's the wrong thing to go in and and try and topple a dictator. Obviously, he did that during Libya. But again, he came to regret that. Um, And he he actually, he shied away from his threat uh, uh, when he was going to strike Syria. Um, Obviously, the Syria policy is bigger than that, just that one act. But, But still, I mean, Obama would say that he's actually doing the more responsible thing by using what he calls surgical strikes, quote unquote, which by the way is the same thing Gabbard says. Um, and and by using special forces to just sort of kind of, uh, you know, surgically strike and, and strike at very specific particular people. Wait, and, so and are, we know are, are, are we saying practice, that are we saying that Bernie has ruled out surgical strikes at this point? No, I haven't. But okay. uh, well, for example, Sanders has voted against all of Trump's military budgets. Gabbard hasn't. Uh, Sanders hasn't done some of those anti-Iran votes that Gabbard did uh, in the lead up to the Iran deal, for example. You know, the other thing that the thing that we're not talking about as well is the very, very weird uh, connections Gabbard has with Hindu nationalists, which I don't know why this should not be something that is off limits to talk about. If a candidate had the the had extensive links with a far right overseas organization that Gabbard has with with the RSS and the BJP, um, that would be a really huge deal. Um, and, you know, it's significant the fact that she said, you know, one of the things that the U.S. has to ally with India over, one of the, one of the common uh, pieces of common ground that they can work together on is fighting terrorism. Um, now, look, maybe Sanders, if, if he even wins, 
he gets in and he uh, all this stuff about we have to change course from just sort of bombing and thinking that just bombing and killing people is going to uh, you know change things and end terrorism. Maybe he dispenses with all that, but he has at least acknowledged that that's the case. I don't know if Gabbard has really acknowledged that. Yes, regime change very bad. We we know that's definitely going to exacerbate and, and make things even worse than if it was just the uh, counterterrorism plus, quote-unquote, uh, uh, option or strategy that Obama took. But the thing is, drone strikes and special forces strikes still kill people. They still make people resentful towards the U.S. government. They still make people terrified to be in their homes. I mean, what was one of the first things that Trump did when he became uh, president? He, he launched that... Uh, that raid in, in Yemen where, what was it, like 30 people died, mostly civilians, a little girl. Um, you know, drone strikes, it's really worth acknowledging how destructive and, and psychologically damaging drone strikes are. They're very often, uh, well, well, one, we don't actually know uh, for sure how many militants they're killing because uh, Obama, of course, put it, so that um, any military age male that is killed by a drone um, counts as a militant. Um, and, and it's all very untransparent. It's very hard to get information. We, we have sort of uh, there, there are organizations on the ground that kind of keep track of this stuff, but the government doesn't. And it has um, very misleading statistics that it puts us, so misleading and, and flawed. Um, but, but people are dying. A lot of people are dying. And even if they don't die, I mean, imagine the terror of going about your life. And knowing that if you hear that noise, that, that distinctive noise of a drone flying, that this could be the end. You know, I mean, people, people were killed uh, at weddings, you know, the happiest day of their lives. They were, they and everyone they knew was slaughtered in just the space of, I don't know, uh, a few minutes, maybe half an hour. Um, that is, if, if, we, if that keeps happening, it's it's not going to matter if you don't do regime change because because terrorists are going to keep springing up um, because you know there's there's still this far off power that is just launching um, death from the sky uh, at, at at you and your family for no particular reason um, and that's going to keep creating terrorists and it's going to keep creating people who who want to hurt Americans and again whether Sanders follows up on his speech or not. Would, would that remains to be seen, but he at least acknowledges that that is not the case, that that that, that will not work. And I don't know if Gabbard has. Um, I, I, mean, I think I think, that is, I, you know, I, I think I think she has acknowledged that in in certain respects, probably not in the wholesale way that that Bernie did. And you know, I, right. I agree with you in terms of the terror wrought by drone strikes. So no disagreement on the substance there. It, it's more about what she has said to acknowledge what you just laid out there, I think, I think is a little more extensive than perhaps you appreciate. And then also on the issue of, oh, all, and, but and, what, what and, has she said about drone strikes and special? Cause I, to me, okay, look, I, I totally understand the uh, support for her as kind of the anti-imperialist candidate as a candidate who's kind of willing to go further than anyone in terms of challenging these kind of basic precepts of us foreign policy. I totally get that. But she, she's not. She's not willing to go as far as she could. I mean, if she wanted to make this really the issue and, and someone who's completely different from the rest of the field, why and, – and even different from someone like Sanders, then why not say we need to move away from, from this aspect as well and be better than Sanders on it? And the fact that she won't, I mean, it, I, can't call, I can't call her an anti-imperialist. Uh, if she's still very much uh, focused on eradicating terrorism through just kind of bombing random villages in the Middle East, no, that, that, that's fair. I mean, I think it's it's more a matter of of emphasis for for her. You're right that she overwhelmingly emphasizes the regime change aspect, which even if it's sort of conventional wisdom now or approaching uh, conventional wisdom in the Democratic Party to be at least in theory against regime change. The way that she discusses it, I think, is a little. It's a. It's more. Um. It's more comprehensive, and uh, it's it's more rooted in like in a philosophical uh, niche that she's she's carved out, and I just don't think like. Maybe I could ask her more about it, right? But I don't know that have any of the candidates really been asked about drone strikes recently. I just don't know that it's it's enough of a hot topic, where, 
they're being held accountable for what their their views are. It's just like it's so it's a matter of like what gets brought up that she hasn't discussed it. I, I agree, much. but this is her issue. I mean, this is this is like uh, like Sanders, you know, whose whose big issue is kind of inequality and the uh, the the domination of of the country by wealthy interests not being asked a very basic question about you know um about that that subject so i mean i i think that she does have to answer for it. and listen i would love to be proven wrong i would l- very much love it it'll be great to have someone who is a consistent and far more radical voice uh against uh the direction of u.s foreign policy for the last uh you know um <laughs> at least 20 years uh you know ideally more so that would be great um i'm not i'm not sold yet that Gabbard is that person, but you know, uh, it may well be that in the uh, in the coming years, because um, you know, I, I assume she'll be in the in the political political scene for a while. Uh, it may well be that we uh, that, that she kind of maintains this position, and um, and and if after you know, I don't know, four years, maybe more, um, I see that she really has you know committed to this and 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 really has reoriented the way she thought about it um i'll be very willing to say you know i i in the same way that i that i have been about sanders i'll be very willing to say you know um i i think she has moved and and that's good and and we should really have another closer look at it that's fair and uh just to, just very briefly because you mentioned the, the modi thing i think I don't want to sound like an apologist, right? I know that's going to be the inevitable accusation, <laughs> but I do think that the the links and the ties that people assert between her and the RSS and such have been a little bit overstated. And I don't want to dwell on that because I want to wrap up soon because we've been going for a while. So, so one final, yeah, that's one final question. Well, can I can I just say just yeah. on on that topic, there was a piece written for the Caravan, it, which yeah. is now I'm not familiar it. with. Uh, very exhaustive. I mean, it took me like over an hour to read, but I mean, I think uh, I think it's pretty significant. I mean, you know, there was a, there was a whether it was an RSS person or a BJP person, I can't remember, but there was somebody from one of those entities that was at her wedding. Which, yeah, again, you know, if this if we were talking about a, a far right party from from Europe that was like at some politician's wedding, we would uh, we would we would be pretty uh, alarmed. And that's just that's just one kind of drop in the ocean of all these different right but i mean but, you know, people, the, 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 the context there right and <laughs> i said i wasn't going to dwell on it but just i guess i'll dwell on it momentarily <laughs> i mean the context there was that she was the first hindu ever elected to the u.s congress right so in that capacity she was the head of the kind of u.s indian relations caucus she obviously wanted to forge ties with what was then the ruling party in India at the time of her, her, her wedding, right? For, for that's her diplomatic approach. She'll, she wants to forge ties with everybody, which you can agree or disagree with. Um, and, and so obviously her being a Hindu attracted a certain amount of interest and intrigue amongst, especially the American uh, Indian di- diaspora, most of whom, by the way, are Democrats um, who have given to other Democratic Hindu candidates in terms of financial contributions. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, just, I feel as though um, the, 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 the ideological implication in, that, in, this, in, the, in the, uh, the notion that she had this direct, somehow political affinity with those people be, by dint of those quote-unquote ties seems to me a little uh, overstated, and I, I did read that long Well, article. people, yeah, I mean, people should read that piece and make, and make up their minds, but, I mean, would we say the same thing about Israel? Um, I mean, sure, people can and, and do say similar justifications. You know, we have to maintain ties with an important ally. We have to, uh, you know, or maybe they'll they'll say, you know, because of religious elements. I'm uh, this this is why I have all these links to kind of far right uh, Israeli figures or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think I, I think I think the centrality of Israel in terms of U- U.S. foreign policy makes it more of a unique case than than India. Um, in terms of why that would be troubling if you could ascertain those quote unquote ties. Um, but anyway, yeah, people could, could read it for themselves. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah, we probably won't end up agreeing on this, but I, you know, people should read it and they may not agree with me. They may well agree with you, but uh, yeah, the caravan uh, is the, is the publication. Right. Okay. So final question here. Um, now that we're in the midst of this uh, Ukraine gate flare up, what do you think? Mm. What do you think that portends in terms of like, in, in terms of foreign policy? Because one thing that drives me nuts about it is that 
the core allegation, right, is supposedly that Trump used U.S. military aid to Ukraine as a, a point of leverage to extract a commitment from Zelensky to uh, investigate whether it was Biden or whether it was the origins of the Russia investigation is sort of like muddled. Um, but in, in, in any event, he was he, he wanted uh, to the allegations that he was using military aid as a as an instrument of of, of obtaining you know, uh, political benefit for himself. And everybody seems to forget that the question of whether it's wise or sound policy to send military aid in the first place is like something that's still like a live issue that probably warrants a little bit of consideration. Like they gets totally <laughs> drowned out in the midst of the partisan furor. Uh, and that's that, that aspect to me has just been maddening. Yeah. Uh, you know, this issue is just, it's it's so tiresome and and just uh, dull in many ways. Uh, not because it's not necessarily that there's interesting things to it, but it's just the the rhetoric, the discourse around it is so divorced from reality and unhinged and and just uh, in some well actually in, in many cases just flat out wrong. Um, that it's it's it, yeah I I've honestly kind of disengaged from it. I I've kept up with it a little bit. My my thoughts on it are this. First of all, it's not clear to me. I've seen multiple people claim different things because I thought the issue was that he had used the military aid and kind of it was hinting that he would condition it on um, basically the Ukrainian president, the new Ukrainian president, uh, finding or you know perhaps just making something out of thin air about Biden and the uh, the Burisma uh, uh, controversy. But then there's other people who are saying that the problem with this uh the, the 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 kind of impeachable offense that the great crime involved is that he tried to get another country to involve itself in the u.s political process um which is if that if that's what people think the crime is then of course the question is well why why was it okay for hillary clinton to uh work with ukraine to get dead on trump it's literally the exact same thing um, but people just pretend like that either didn't happen, or they just pretend that it's a conspiracy theory, which is absolutely not Politico reported on it. Right. Um, or they the or they pretend that it's a right wing talking point or something. Right. In addition to bring up the Steele dossier, remember that, which was the epitome of using uh, <laughs> using political power in the case of Hillary Clinton in the DNC. Although she wasn't obviously president, she did use her stature indirectly so she did it with a little bit of at least initial plausible deniability to make a case against trump that was based on quote-unquote foreign assistance that they contracted with a spy to uh compile so like what is the operating principle here that we're supposed to believe is uh automatically leads to impeachment right what is so unique about this that you couldn't also make the same allegation of other parties and other figures for that is right. what I'm struggling to to comprehend still. Well, and the answer is it doesn't seem like there is. I mean, you know, again, if it's about conditioning military aid, um, then okay. But it seems like a lot of people are saying that the the military aid is kind of beside the point. It's just the fact that uh, any country was being invited to 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 um, you know engage itself in in the U.S. political process, and I mean. That's ridiculous as well. I mean, Mitt Romney um, uh, has obviously, you know, made headlines by condemning Trump over this. But Mitt Romney and and Netanyahu during the 2012 election were basically working in cahoots to get Obama. Uh, Netanyahu uh, cut TV ads, I believe, for Mitt Romney, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I believe that is correct. So it's like, again, I mean, it's it's basically just – the principle seems to be if it's it's bad if the consensus of the kind of political establishment or national security establishment says it's bad. You know, oh, it's fine for Israel to constantly involve itself in U.S. affairs in in, uh, in outrageous ways that no country would be normally able to do. But that's because they're an ally. Um, and of course, as you said, you know, with Ukraine, Ukraine's an ally, quote unquote. But there's been no discussion about whether it's wise or morally right to be uh, arming or at the very least giving aid to an ally that has significant uh, – the significant presence of, of neo-Nazis 
and, and other far right elements um, in in the state. You know, I mean that that seems like it's kind of if we oppose Trump because he's you know uh, supposedly a fascist or what what have you, a white supremacist, maybe that deserves uh, to have some discussion as well. But of course, you know, no, because. Again, you know, I, I, I think you probably agree with me here. I don't think any, this has anything to do with principle. I think it's the Democrats just wanting to to get Trump out. And, you know, of course, who wouldn't want to get Trump out? Um, you know, for multiple reasons. But th- this could very But the way that you go it. about doing it also matters because of the yes. potential uh disadvantageous kind of like principles that the process could enshrine if it's done in a way that is totally unmoored from any um any uh you know recognition of reality in the sense that you actually want to at least pretend that you're advancing a coherent principle if you're saying that the president should be impeached over it and if it just falls apart upon minimal examination people are going to conclude that it's just this knee-jerk partisan thing which is going to inflame tensions for all the wrong reasons and give proponents of Trump perhaps even a legitimate grievance to question why it is he's being undercut in this manner rather than just letting it go forward with the electoral cycle when, you know, Trump isn't to the extent that its noxious elements can be repudiated at the ballot box, uh, that that can that can take place. So they're 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 preempting that with this sort of uh march toward I'm not going to say extra legal removal because obviously impeachment is in the Constitution, but it would be so unprecedented for it to happen. Like literally, it has never happened that a president has been removed, although they too have been impeached. But were it to happen, you could just imagine it creating such hysteria that I think it's uh, it's almost unfathomable that it would actually produce anything that's politically beneficial. But then again, who knows? Right. Well, and the other thing is that this, uh, if this fails, uh, you can't impeach Trump ever again, because now the first time they did it was something that turned out to be completely untrue. Uh, now, I mean, you know, this obviously, uh, is true. Um, but if it turns out that you mean that they first, at least Biden, they like the, if they first at least attempted to initiate the process around Mueller and that right was ill fated. Yeah, to say the least. Um, and the thing is, I mean, it's it, you know, it seems based on the reporting. I know Bloomberg has said that it's just the, the claim that that uh, there was an investigation into Burisma and, and Biden's son when he had the prosecutor fired was completely wrong. Um, but let's say that it does turn out to be true. Because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Biden hasn't like actually explicitly denied. Um, uh, that this didn't happen. I think he said, you know, there's no credible outlet that gives a credence. That doesn't mean that it actually happened. But I don't know. It's a little when you when you just say outright this is completely untrue. I don't know. But perhaps perhaps that's nothing. But let's say that I mean they he's do he's find... denied all wrongdoing, which right. kind of allows him to evade getting into the specifics. Yeah. Right. Well, and and again, it also depends on how Trump phrased the request, um, which I'm I'm not. Off the top of my head, I'm 100% sure how he did it. But let's say that in the course of this impeachment, they find out that uh, – because I think they're actually going to do a, an investigation again in Ukraine as well. Let's say that they find – like maybe if Biden didn't do that, but that there was really some serious um, you know, uh, shady stuff going on between you know what, what his son was doing and, and, and his position as vice president. Well, that essentially vindicates Trump. Um, I mean, you know, maybe – the Democrats have to hope that that is not the case, because if it is, that completely undercuts the entire thing they're saying, because it makes Trump look like the hero. Like, oh, no, he was actually doing the right thing. He was he was uh, using military aid in order to, to crack down on corruption. So we'll see. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if, if you're Joe Biden, you're going to be sweating right now because <laughs> this is going to just lay lay out for the, the public just how um, how again, how dirty and kind of corrupt the democratic party is um you know uh maybe maybe not as bad as the republican party but but pretty bad and that's uh that's not great going into an election what do you think this does to just the wider political climate because this is sort of a theory that i've been advancing which is that when everything gets distilled into this binary choice of impeachment versus no impeachment it kind of constricts the range of acceptable political discussion into this pretty tiny box 
Um, and I struggle to see how that benefits, for example, Bernie, who obviously is trying to expand like the paradigm politically for what's available to, to people. Um, I feel, I just, it, it just seems as though if everybody's laser focused on impeachment for the next like four or five months or something, I, again, it's difficult to predict, but I, I have a hard time imagining how that benefits him. It's not as though, you know, the, um, the procedural minutia that's attendant to impeachment, such as, you know, what articles are going to be referred to what committee and what witnesses are going to be called, et cetera, et cetera, like uh, what statutes were violated. That's not really in his political wheelhouse. <laughs> um, so uh, I sort of question uh, whether whether a, a political climate con- uh, dominated by this is conducive in particular to to his interests. I mean, but obviously, who can say? But that's just my sense. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen the polling about this. If it's anything like, I mean, I, I know that there are people who are it's a majority folk, uh, that, that favor impeachment. Um, but as far as the polling of you know where people rank this and the and the issues that are most important to them, I mean, I would assume that's probably similar to uh, Russia Gate, which was uh, kind of near zero for most voters. You know, so I think um, I think you know he and the rest of the candidates will have to kind of like uh genuflected this and kind of like oh yeah yeah this is important but you know let's get back to the real meat and potatoes issues i i I think they realize that they're not going to actually at least when it comes to running a campaign they're not going to beat trump by by focusing on this um even 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 though they have to basically say they support it well i mean warren's um, happy warren is happy to focus on it to some extent anyway i mean i went to her big speech in new york city a couple weeks ago and she made one of her like uh, signature rallying cries. We must impeach Trump. So like it's something that she mm. does bring up on her own accord because she obviously perceived there to be some political benefit in her talking about it a lot. Um, right. So I just I, well, I, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe it's like part of her stump speech. Tie... You know. Right. Right. I, I'm sure it could probably it ties into her kind of drive for anti-corruption because you know this is a, an example of corruption the problem there though is i mean the biden hunter biden thing is also an example of corruption you know when one was asked about that uh when asked you know would your vice president would their child be able to sit on the board of a, a foreign company um she she said yes and then and then instantly said well, actually i'm not sure i have to i have to check you know so if she's going to make this a centerpiece of her campaign, I think she has to be ready to say that what Biden did was wrong as well. And that that's sort of the issue that when you actually make this a center point of your kind of candidacy, uh, you run into these issues because she's going to, I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to be stuck on stage having to defend what Biden did or like waving it away, particularly if you're someone like someone like Elizabeth Warren, who's entire thing is about good government and and ethics and and rooting out uh the influence of, of money um i mean the other thing is I, I what do people think is going to happen when they impeach him i mean you know i think trump deserves to be impeached for all manner of heinous crimes um that that are far worse than this ukraine thing but what do people think is going to happen i mean even if you get rid of him <laughs> they haven't thought that deeply about it <laughs> right yeah i mean mike pence would possibly even be more dangerous than Trump. I mean, the the one thing we know about Trump is that he's at least inconsistently committed to um, to to uh, uh, kind of avoiding war. You know, he he has at times, again, very inconsistently, very inconsistently, but he has at times pushed back against some of the some of the war stuff. He called off that Iranian uh, strike at the last minute uh, because apparently Tucker Carlson called him. Um, I don't think Mike Pence would do that. I don't think right. Mike Pence is going to get a call from Tucker Carlson and then change his mind um, at the last minute. There, so, was re- there was reporting actually recently about that Iran incident that said, you know, Pence was shocked and dismayed when Trump called off the strikes of the last. Oh, know, good. Right. So great. <laughs> well, there you go. You know, I think that that's a thing that no one ever really talks about. I mean, I guess it's, everyone assumes that it's not going to work, but um, I don't know. I mean, if you really committed to this as a serious policy shouldn't you discuss like what the the post trump strategy is i don't know i don't know it's a mess that's all i know yeah (laughs) all right so uh why don't we leave it there thank you for having a protracted discussion it was uh interesting i hope quite all right yeah it was uh it was enjoyable 
All right, maybe we'll do it again sometime. We all learned a lot. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Take care. All right, take care. Okay, there you have it. As always, if you found this edifying, please consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal, the information for which is in the description box. So I will see you next time. Fare thee well.